and thank you for joining today's talk in CCMP seminar series. I would like to start with acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of Kulin nations as the traditional owners of the land on which our park will campus stand. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various land on which you are all joining me from today. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and to the Aboriginal elders of the community. I'm Bhavika, a Centre PhD student at Monash Nu. So before starting the seminar, I would like to remind you that this seminar will be recorded and will be available on CCMP website. Uh, I would also like to tell you that the presentation will last for 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes Q&A session. So please save the question to the end of the seminar. You can either raise your hand or pop, in, pop the question in the chat box and I can read them for you in the end. Uh, please stay muted throughout the presentation. Uh, today, we are very excited to have Dr. Alisa Glukova. Uh, Dr. Alisa is a laboratory head in Structural Biology Division at Weihai and a senior research fellow in the Department of Biochemistry and Pharmacology at University of Melbourne. She earned her PhD in Chemical Biology in 2014 from the University of Michigan, where, she's, uh, where she worked on solving structures of lipid-modifying enzyme using X-ray crystallography. During her postdoctoral training at MIPS, she used X-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and pharmacology techniques to study different GPCRs. Since joining Weihai in 2020, Alisa has focused on understanding the structural and biochemical aspects of Venn signaling pathway, an important pharmacological target for treating many cancers. Using structural biology, her team captures snapshots of different stages in the Venn signaling cascade to understand the atomic picture and gain insights into various aspects of signaling transmission through Venn pathway. Welcome, Alisa. Um, over to you. Thank you, Bhavika. Thank you for this nice introduction. And thank you, everybody else, um, for coming. And thank you for inviting me. Um, and it is my uh, very great pleasure to share with you what I've been up to um, in the last couple of years since I left MIPS. Oh, all right. All right. So just a very brief introduction to what my lab is um, trying to study. So the Glukova lab um, is based at VHI and uh, the primary um, um, topic that we're interested in is the wind signaling, where we try to understand how Wins, um, and I'll introduce them later. So they're, they're um, protein ligands. So how they secrete, how they get a transfer and how they activate their receptors. I've also worked on a few collaborative projects from within uh, with people at VHI and also at MIPS. And then there's um, this a little bit of a standalone project uh, the 12 epoxygenase. And so today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, my primary area of interest. So the wind signaling and um, also a little bit about the 12 um, LOX project. All right, so part one. So the structural biology of porcupine. So first, uh, I wanted to give you just a very, very brief introduction about what is wind signaling and why I was so interested in, well, my lab is so interested in studying it. Um, so a lot of people here are probably very familiar with uh, GPCR, so G-protein coupled receptors. Um, so one of the classes GPCR, so class F, uh, from, um, have a lot of uh, frizzled receptors uh, uh, that also participate in whatever GPCRs normally do, but also they have a lot of um, complex signaling that they can undertake that's quite unique to other GPCRs. And I'm not going to go into what that signaling is, I'm just um, stop at the fact that it's quite unique, involves completely different protein targets, um, and uh, what's interesting is that all of those result receptors, so GPCRs, are activated by uh, protein ligands. And those protein ligands are called VINs. And so hence the name for the VIN signaling pathway. And so total, there are 19 VINs. And the proteins, they're fairly large proteins, about 40 kilodalton. And they're absolutely required to have palmitylation for the interaction with result receptors. So it's not a regular kind of methylation that you would expect for uh, normal proteins to have. So it's not for binding to the lipid bilayer, though it also might maybe help with that. Um, that methylation happens on the serine residue and it is absolutely required for the interaction with receptors. And so the protein I will be talking to you about is called porcupine. 
And this is the enzyme that sits in the ER and it basically adds this palmitol uh, lipid onto the Vint uh, proteins. So it is absolutely required for Vint secretion, for Vint activity. And because it's a single enzyme that um, does it for all of the bits, you can imagine that is quite an important pharmacological target because if Vint were to be absent, then none of the Vint signaling can happen at all. So why do we care about Vint signaling at all? It's because it's quite important in uh, development. It's also very important in adults for maintaining normal tissue homeostasis. So uh, it's required for cell differentiation for determining cell fate. And because of that, you can imagine uh, it's an important target for many, many human cancers um, because uh, if cells get dysregulated, then we have um, abnormal division, abnormal growth, uh, metastasis. And so multiple, multiple steps of this pathway um, can be targets for um, pharmacological targets. So the receptors themselves, so GPCRs, um, there's some drugs that scavenge away the ligands. Uh, there are drugs that target um, steps downstream, so beta catenin. There's drugs that target some transcriptional factors. And then, of course, uh, the porcupine, the enzyme itself, is um, an important pharmacological target because, again, you stop porcupine from uh, oscillating vent, nothing happens. And because of that, there's actually quite a few uh, drugs that are in clinical developments that target porcupine. Um, all right, so to sum up, so porcupine, palmitolates went on consortium, so serine 209. Uh, it is absolutely essential for wind processing and secretion. It is transmembrane protein, hence me presenting it in this uh, seminar. Uh, so it's in ER resident uh, protein. Um, it also belongs to this um, AMBOT uh, protein family member. So it's a, a, a family of o, uh, membrane bound O acetyl transferases. And it is an important therapeutic cancer targeting cancer. All right, so uh, my postdoc really likes to draw porcupine as an actual porcupine. So you'll see this quite a bit. Um, so it takes this vent, so it's a protein, and adds palmitil to this very conserved beta hairpin. So this is the uh, the better hairpin, and then the, the serine this this polytel residue, and this is just some of the um, examples of the drugs that either um, made it to clinical trials or haven't, but they're still high affinity um, inhibitors of porcupine. So among those, I think LGK974 made it through phase one. Um, but you can see they're very very high affinity. So affinity was never really an issue with those drugs. Um, all right, so a little bit about this MBOT um, pro uh, protein family member. So they're all um, transmembrane proteins. They have somewhere between 10 and 12 um, transmembrane helices. Um, they always have this cup-like structure um, and they all oscillate various things. So porcupine obviously oscillates protein vent. Um, H hat, this is the hedgehog acyl transfer, is also um, um, transfers a lipid on a hedgehog. And then there are a few, so acyl cholesterol acyl transferase, lysophospholipid acyl transferase, the acyl glycerol acyl transferase, so those all acyl lipids. So um, a bit difference in their substrate, but the overall reaction is the same. So they would take acyl. CoA of some sort, and then trans transfer the lipid onto the substrate. Um, right when we, I also should probably say that when we started working on it, none of those structures were determined, uh, minus the DLTB that was solved. Actually, no, I think that one wasn't there either. Uh, so basically we had no idea how it looks. We straight away knew that it's gonna be challenging. So the porcupine itself is only 55 kilodalton and it's a membrane protein. And we didn't expect it to have any domains that would be outside of the membrane. So this is the rendering of basically what we expect it to look. So in a detergent by cell, um, there's basically nothing sticking out of the membrane. So this is probably the landscape of the cryodium at when we started, so 2020, you can see um, at 55 Kel Dalton, 
the chances of us getting it was quite low. Um, so we're working it for a bit, and the longer we work for it, the more structures were coming out. And at that point, I was getting more and more hopeful that this target would be amenable by cryon without any additional modifications. And it is because most of the proteins that from the family form other dimers or tetramers. So I cut forms of dimer, DGAT, powers of dagger, I think I'll be cut. I don't remember right now, but this one was quite recent. The LTP forms dimers and tetramers. The only one that doesn't is hedgehog acyl transferase that was sold as a monomer. And um, for the solution of the structure, um, they had to identify um, fab fragments to basically increase the size and then uh, being able to solve it by cryo. Um, and sadly, hedgehog acyl transferase is the one that the closest homolog of the porcupine. But nevertheless, we were hopeful. Um, we uh, purified the protein using the mammalian cell system, so, uh, and BACMAM. Um, so size inclusion got nice monomer peak. Um, that didn't help us with figuring out what is, it is. Is it monomer or dimer? So we spent quite a bit of time trying to figure it out. So the multi-angle light scheduling suggests this is about 170 kilodalton which could be either a monomer plus a really big micelle or a dimer with a smaller micelle. Um, but nevertheless, we went ahead. So we, um, this is just to show you that our protein was quite active. So this is the CPM activity assay where the CPM uh, that maybe a few people are familiar with is a dye for thermal stability. But um, in our case, it also could be a substrate for porcupine. Um, so um, porcupine was quite active. We could also see the activity using um, LCMS. So this is the peptide and the modified peptide um, gets a shift. And then if we add the inhibitor, this does not happen. So this is the quantification. Um, nevertheless, we were optimistic enough to put this in grids and lo and behold, uh, we managed to solve the structure with to 2.4 angstroms without any additional modifications. So again, this is pretty small, it was 55. I should also say we did have a fused GFP that we didn't cut off, but that was never meant for structural biology. So it was very, very flexible. We never saw it in any of our 2D classes or it never contributed to any sort of image alignment. Um, now I know that we were just really, really lucky, um, but nevertheless, um, I think it's one of the smallest transmembrane proteins that was solved um, at that point in NOVA. So 2.4 um, global resolution, and you can see their resolution, um, the local resolution is also actually quite good. Um, so this is the overall map. Um, as, I, as we expected, basically all of the porcupine lines within the myself, so without anything that um, sticking outside. Um, density was very good for both the proteins and also the ligand that we use, so the C59. And if we look at this, I think this is still back in 2020, um, we're quite at the low um, limit of what's feasible for cryom, at least back then. Um, so I guess not surprising that it looks pretty much like other both family members. So it's this um, chalice-like structure where we have the, um, sorry, this, um, the opening, that's where the CoA would bind. And then, um, so this would be the cytosolic side and then the opposite, this is where Vint would bind. And then the inhibitor uh, basically takes a place of the lipid group of the CoA. Um, so if you look at the surface rendering, so this very nice positively charged area. So this is where the phosphate would bind from the um, palmitol AK. Unfortunately though, um, while we were processing, um, we were scooped. So another group determined the structure of porcupine. So they did it um, by identifying um, FB fragments that bind and increase the size of the porcupine. And then they had very nice cryo maps. And uh, not only were we scoped, we were scoped really, really extensively because they solved the structure, not just as inhibitor, but also with the vent peptide. And also with, I think it was with acyl CoA, uh, basically with everything you could possibly want to figure out how this enzyme um, works. 
Um, obviously, it hurts quite a bit, um, other than the fact that our resolution is still quite a bit higher than even the best one they got, and we got it without any um, um, additional stabilization techniques or any additional uh, binding partners. Uh, nevertheless, um, our structure is very, very similar to theirs. Uh, the overlay is um, almost identical. Uh, the ligands we use um, it quite just a little bit different, but the pose is basically identical. Um, one of the questions I get is whether we could um, predict why, for example, there's such a different, well, a small, fairly small difference in affinity. And um, I, to be honest, I couldn't. The contacts don't really seem to favor one versus another. Um, one thing that we noticed is our um, structure, though, it's um, some additional density that we thought might be uh, a lipid, so POPS, uh, phosphodiesterone. And the reason for that is if we were to run thermostability assay of porcupine, and porcupine is different drugs. So it's probably fairly familiar for people who work with um, GPCR. So it's the CPM-based assay where we just um, add the CPM and look at the protein unfolding. Uh, by increasing fluorescence, so porcupine by itself, and then we have the C59, the drug increases germ stability by about five degrees, and then we tried a few other drugs, including the LKG974, that our competitors got a structure, and they were a bit lower, uh, but also the interesting thing is the POPS, uh, POPS, so this lipid, what people have been saying for years, that it might be important for porcupine activity, and it appears that it's important for stability as well. And please ignore all those um, statistics here. Um, I'm actually not sure how this has been done. So I'm going to reevaluate this. Um, but anyway, so if we were to examine the map, there is um, there's a pretty significant density that might be attributed to POPS. And interestingly, it sits right on top of the um, ligand. So we are um, currently trying to figure out if this density is indeed POPS. And if that is the mechanism for POPS stabilization of porcupine. Um, but that uh, density basically overlaps with the palmitial LQA that was determined in one, um, that was identified in one of the competitor structures. So we're wondering if um, POPS might um, basically bind somehow nearby and play an actual structural role that we can see in the map. But um, I'm still not sure about that. So the conclusion for this part one, so we, uh, oh, probably I should also mention that once uh, we got the structure with the C59 and after we got scoped, so I thought that we could go on and maybe um, at least get structures with other inhibitors, um, either that are in clinical trials or um, that people are currently pursuing just to make the story a bit more interesting. Um, but it turns out that Solvent structure by cryam or such a tiny protein is actually hit or miss. And yes, we were very, very lucky that we got it with C59. I uh, tried quite a few times after that, knowing all the things we know now uh, in terms of what was required to get that structure. And we could never get it below about six angstroms. Um, so whether that was because our um, drug that we used to, was really uh, very significant in terms of stabilizing porcupine, um, I don't know, but none, uh, we couldn't get either the APO structure or structure with any of the drugs that were not nearly as thermostabilizing as C59. Um, all right, so conclusions, porcupine resembles other embolic family members. Um, the binding post for the inhibitor is almost identical to the LKG954. And then we think we might have identified POPS um, that stabilized porcupine through interaction with the SLK binding site. Um, what we still don't know, and what nobody else knows is um, how does porcupine actually oscillate uh, binds to bind in order to oscillate it. So the structures from competitive structures um, um, had a structure of porcupine with the vent peptide. Uh, however, if we use the entire structure of the vent, um, there are quite a few clashes that's going on. We suggest that um, there has to be some sort of rearrangements in order to bind vent. 
And some of those rearrangements might include additional interactions that might not um, be appreciated just from modeling alone. And what's quite interesting about those interactions is um, if we uh, do the alpha fold modeling, then um, there are some interactions and in the loops um, that has difference in different porcupine as a forms. So we're still pursuing in my lab um, the structure of the complex of wind and porcupine, just trying to see if um, we can get there and see if the actual porcupine is isoforms um, might have a um, might have some other sort of different um, um, interactions with wind. All right, and so this is still an area of um, active research. All right, and then the second part of my talk, which is not really related to the first one, other than the fact that. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the um, using cryam to identify um, drug binding and drug interactions with the enzyme. Um, unfortunately, not on the membrane protein, but I thought it'd still be quite of interest to this audience. So um, it's the 12 lip oxygenase project. So this is a collaborative project um, that was done by postdocs in my and Dave Tal's lab, so by Jesse and Katrina. Um, and it's a collaboration between um, me. So my lab, uh, MIPS, um, and also University of um, California, Santa Cruz and University of Michigan. So we're switching gears quite a bit here. So lipoxygenases, they're cytosolic proteins, so not membrane associated. Uh, well, they might be membrane associated, but they're not transmembrane of any sort. Uh, so they're non-heme containing, iron containing enzymes. And what they do is they oxidize arachidonic acid using the oxygen. And there are quite a few um, in humans. So the difference is that they oxidize um, different positions of this arachidonic acid, creating all those signaling molecule, like five heat, 12 heat, 15, and so on. And you can imagine that um, this is quite important for signaling. Um, all right. So the enzyme I will be talking about is called 12 oxygenase. It's very highly expressed in platelets. And the metabolites, so 12 hit, um, very important for platelet activation. So once the 12 lux is activated, it produces 12 hit, um, actually produces a couple other things as well. And they can go on and um, activate downstream um, either GPCR, so the 12 hit receptor, um, or prostacycline receptor that's not shown here, and ultimately go on to activate platelets. And um, the idea is that this enzyme can be a target for platelet activation, um, specifically, and maybe to prevent bleeding, like a novel medication basically to prevent bleeding. Um, currently it's past phase one for the heparin induced um, thrombocytopenia. Uh, Sorry, and I skipped completely the fact that our collaborators have um, a small molecule, ML355, that is a specific 12 lux inhibitor. And this inhibitor is the one that's on trial for the heparin induced champion. Sorry about that. All right, so um, lipoxygenases. Um, we expect them because of the high sequence conservation to be. Uh, to look very similar. So all those um, lipoxygenases that I mentioned before, so the five locks, 12 locks, 15 locks, um, they all should have similar architecture, so should all have um, better barrel domain and then catalytic domain. Um, so we were not here really discovering anything new about the structure of 12 locks. What we were really interested in is where and how does that drug was binding. And so that entire project was, let's figure out how it binds to see if we can improve um, ML355. All right, so the 12 blocks, again, be purified in mammalian cells. Um, and the most unusual thing about this is when we purify it, we always get multiple peaks. Um, so ultimately we realized that one of those peaks were dimer and a tetramer, one size exclusion. So this is the negative stain. So dimer, so you can see two quite obvious uh, monomers. And then the tetramer, 
uh, you can imagine together they they make up for. Um, and every time we would prep this protein, the ratio of those dimers and tetramers would always change. Um, we actually still don't know what governs this equilibrium, um, but using the fairly um, new technique on the block, so the mass photometry, you can see that actually there's quite a few of different species in either of those picks. So for example, if you take the dimer pick and put it on mass photometer, we have monomer, dimer, tetramer, hexamer, and even a little bit of octamer. If you put the tetramer, again, we have a multitude of different things. Uh, monomer, dimer, tetramer prevalent, um, but still have a little bit of hexamer and octamer. So it always just is a mixture. Uh, nevertheless, we went ahead to try to determine the structure. Um, we put both samples from both the Merrick peak and the tetramer peak on the um, grid. And we solved many, many structures of <clears throat> 12 lip oxygenase. So the tetramer peak primarily gave rise to the tetramer, and that was, I think, 1.8 global resolution. And then the dimeric peak, we managed to get four structures out of the same grid from the same data collection. So monomer, dimer, tetramer, hexamer. Now we know there is also apparently an octamer there, but we didn't see that on cryo. So I will not be going through all of them. I will mostly focus on, I will only focus on the drug discovery aspect of this. So for this, I would like to focus, all right, first just a quick overview of how this um, 12 lip oxygenase looks. So it looks like pretty much any other LOX enzyme out there. So again, we have this um, beta barrel domain, and then we have the catalytic domain. Um, there are quite a couple of important um, helices that surround the active site. So the, in the active site, we have this heme, and that's um, the part that does the oxidation of the hedonic acid. Um, right. And overall, the um, conformation does not change throughout most of those oligomeric forms. All right, so the first I will focus on the hexamer. And this is because this is the one where we saw the ML355. All right, so I mentioned that um, it all, all those structures came from a single grid. So the hexamer it was about maybe 10 to 15% of the total population. Um, so, as the name suggests, it's the six molecules of 12 lip oxygenase. So, the map was at 2.6 angstroms. Um, we saw that uh, one of the contacts that is actually quite ab absent in any of the other um, oligomeric forms is this um, cysteine bridge. And we think this is the one that mediates um, the assembly in the, the hexamer. So, it might be oxidation dependent. Um, and so in terms of the densities for the ligands, so this is the entrance to the active site. So we saw two independent densities near this catalytic iron. So one looked like very much um, like a lipid and one looked like what turned out to be a mat Um So this was a bit unusual because all the predictions before suggested that ML355 should take over the um, the lipid. So basically the idea is that this would be a competitive inhibitor so that it would bind where their hedonic acid would bind and basically block the active site. So this was unusual, even though there was some um, enzymatic, um, sorry, some data from the enzymatic um, activity that suggests that um, it has to come uh, uncompetitive -compet un mode of inhibition. Um, but anyway, it was unusual enough. And so we obviously had to prove that this is um, what it would be. Um, so this is the context. They all make very um, good sense. So there's a lot of hydrophobics interactions. And there's quite um, a few um, charge hydrogen bonds. And also there's this um, batch of positively charged residues um, that looks like it would accommodate the so, um the sulfur uh, part really, really well, right? Um, so we obviously tried to confirm that this is the binding pose. So one of the key things that we thought we could do because the drug does not bind into the exercise is that we postulated that there must be mutations that would uncouple 
uh, ML355 binding from the activity of the enzyme. Basically, that we could introduce mutations that would retain the full activity of the enzyme, but would not bind to ML355. Um, so we haven't done this very extensively. So we only started with four mutations. So other this residue L589. So again, we just had to stay away from this part where the hydronic acid would bind. So that's why um, all the residues are concentrated on the bottom here. So the L589, so they're supposed to interact, um, make hydrophobic interactions with the, um, with the ligand, and then you mutated those uh, four positively charged um, residues at the entrance of the actisite. And so the mutations are either the alanine or two corresponding residues in 15 locks that would not bind um, ML355. So unfortunately, three out of those four mutants couldn't um, basically lost all the activity. Uh, perhaps not surprising because you can imagine this, um, um, all those residues also sit at the entrance of the active site. So um, all the ent ent entering and exiting of the uh, substrate should also, um, those residues would be, uh, would have an effect on. However, one of those residues, so the L589A, um, had absolutely no effect on activity of um, the enzyme, but it completely abolished the inhibition by ML355. Um, and also quite interesting, if you put that mutant or mass spectrometer, um, it also abolished uh, the formation of those higher oligomeric species. Um, and since hexamer of the box was the only one where we actually did see um, the ligand binding, we also thought it's a good sign that um, basically those hexamers can't even form in apps in um, the mutated enzyme. All right, so. All right, so now I'll take you to another oligomeric form from the same, um, um, from the same preparation. So in this case, the tetramer. So this was the highest resolution of the structure. And this um, is quite interesting case of how we managed to identify the natural inhibitor of the 12 lipoxygenase. All right, so quite high resolution um, structure. Um, so and this high resolution is due to, we had a lot of particles. So because it's a tetramer, so our original structure was at 1.8 and then we managed to symmetry expand. And then we only had two million particles with the local resolution, um, sorry, with the resolution of individual subunit at 1.7. And this would actually be very, very important later. This is one of those cases where um, even every inch of resolution was very important for figuring out what's going on. All right. Um, so this is just to show off the quality of the map. So we had holes in the aromatic rings. So, you know, once you get there, this is, um, you, you kind of picked in cryem. So this is, um, was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, and so when we first um, got the structure, this is what we had in the active site. So we had this discontinuous density that was kind of weird. It wasn't helping that it was also at the um, interface, so the subunit interface, which we knew would get us quite a bit of the artifacts. Um, so when I had this map first, I was trying to put ML355 in there and it would never really fit properly. And I would tilt it around and still try to fit it and it still won't fit. Um, then at some point we collected the same data set, um, this, um, sorry, the same tetramer in the protein that never saw ML355 and we realized the density was still there. So clearly it couldn't have been the drug, um, but I wasn't really going anywhere with this. Um, and then Jesse, uh, from Talab stepped in. And so whatever I'm gonna tell you next, it was all his brainchild about how to deal with this. And I thought this is quite fascinating um, so, and makes for a very, very interesting story. But so basically that's where we started. So we know it's not a multi by five. We don't know what this is. Artifact it looks really weird. So what do we do about it? So this is the density. Um, and Part of the reason that all this is happening and looks weird is because the enzyme is very 
uh, flexible. So this is the 3D variability analysis. So you can see in the tetramer all those different modes of movement. So obviously probably not gonna help is any sort of density that's located in the interface either. Uh, and then um, Jesse did 3D variability on the density alone. So it's in gray here, so you can see. Um, this is just three different modes. So in here and here you can see, yeah, it kind of moves, nothing really happens, but it's in this one. So I'll run it over again. Sorry. Um, that was quite interesting. So you can see jumping between one monomer, one monomer and another, which suggested to us that it could have been actually partially occupancy. And that what's happening is because we have a tetramer, it just averages out. And so the way to deal with it is to basically try to separate the monomers that would have it from the ones that wouldn't. And that's where all those um, humongous amount of particles and very high resolution uh, makes a big difference. So because we had 1.8 million particles after symmetry expansion, what Jesse could do is to run 3D variability in cluster mode, only zoning out around the ligand, and then basically selecting only the subunits that would have the best density for that ligand. So at that point, we're not dealing with the symmetry anymore uh, and only looking at the basically 100% occupancy of the ligand within the monomers. And so after he did that, so he got this, and then he constructed back the entire tetramer. Um, so he had now tetramer with 300 K particles, and this had absolutely gorgeous density for something. So it wasn't discontinuous anymore. It had quite a lot of shape. It was a two angstroms, uh, and we still didn't know what this was. And I should also say that we knew we couldn't identify it using mass mass spec because the lipids or phospholipids we knew they don't fly very well at all in mass spec. So lots of people basically told us don't even bother. Uh, what Jesse did again after he had this is he just went to the lipid maps and just visually tried to imagine what this could be. So this is the density. Um, and apparently two extra resolution you can do that. And he identified just visually as allele CoA. And even if you're skeptical, if your map is at two angstroms, you can see how well the fit is. So all the context makes sense. Um, each phosphate has its own little bulge. The um, CoA, it just, it's an absolutely perfect fit. Um, of course, this is a bit random. Um, And again, you can see the context makes sense. And what's more importantly is um, our collaborator Todd Holman actually tested whether this acyl-CoA um, can be an inhibitor of 12 lipoxygenase. And indeed it did. Um, more, most importantly, so he tested a panel of um, CoAs with um, slightly different saturation and different length. And so all the oil CoA was the one that's at 32 micromolar. Um, it might look, like pretty low um, IC50, but it is not outside of the realm of um, uh, normal concentrations that can occur for those within the cell. So what basically happens here is we purified the natural inhibitor from the HEC293 cells that co-purifies this um, 12 ox. So we still don't really know what this actually means on what's the role of those natural inhibitors. And this is also an area of an active um, research in the future. All right, so in conclusion for this part of the talk, um, so 12 locks exists as a mixture of oligomeric species that might bind inhibitors with different affinities. Um, so ML355 preferentially binds to 12 lock hexamer, allele CAE, this is the natural inhibitor is bound to the 12 ox tetramer. And I haven't gotten in a, to tell you about all the other parts, um, about what we learned about dynamics and from other oligomeric forms. Um, and so the future directions obviously is we need to figure out the connection between all those different oligomeric forms and the catalytic cycle and the membrane binding. Uh, we still don't know what's the role of all of those different oligomeric and 
more importantly, what is this physiological ordinary state in human platelet? So we know it's very heavily expressed, but we don't know um, is it a dimer, a tetramer? And because all those different oligomeric forms appear to have different uh, preference for ligand binding or for even binding to those natural um, inhibitors, we think it'd be actually quite important to figure out how does it exist in the nature. Um, we still don't know what influences the oligomer formation. And um, we don't know if um, this natural inhibitor that we found in HEC cells, um, if similar things would exist in platelets or if that would be something else. All right, and so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab. Um, so Katrina and Wes, so I don't know if I mentioned, but Wes uh, did, quite, did quite a bit of stuff on the 12 blocks project as well, particularly the enzyme um, activity. So Nick, Sushavan, Tin, um, this is all my lab. Um, then there's quite a few people from Beehive that contributed to um, either Porcupine Project or the 12 blocks. Um, like to thank other people from Beehive and then of course the collaborators. Um, so from MIPS, so Tal Lab, from University of California, Santa Cruz, so Holman Lab, University of Michigan, Hollinstead Lab. And then of course, all of this imaging for both projects was done at Trauma COD Center um, by Hari. And of course, all the funding and um, yeah, that's about it. And thank you all for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Alisa. It was a great talk. Um, I would open the floor for questions if anybody has some. Okay, uh, Matt. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Um, tell me why you think the frizzled receptor worked. Um, you know, you know, because it, it's obviously a very tricky thing to refine, and as you said, it doesn't have many features to help alignment. So, what, what, why do you think it? You were met with success with that one, and maybe not some of the other things you've been trying. Um, in short, I don't know, but obviously, I have theories on that. <laughs> I'd love to. I, I'd, I'd even love to hear the theories. Like, uh, I think that we really got lucky with the drugs. So I think that the drug we used, and that was done before we done the thermofluor, it was so thermostable that we were able to basically lock our helices in such a precise orientation that the alignment just happened. So basically the problem is for the, for the porcupine, whenever you do the um, processing, if you count along the helices below six centimeters, it's around six. Basically, under six, you can see the helix pitch, and it it basically breaks that um, the hump. You're mm. you're done because then helices can be aligned because there's nothing else to align. And I think everything else they might be just a little too fuzzy, and yeah. that lock basically just didn't happen. So I think it's the six axioms is the same. You either get over it or you don't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. You do you think it was just uh, like reducing potential like dynamic search space that the protein was could sample? You're sort of limiting it. What that it would be my guess because we, yeah. we tried. We really tried. So um, I saw you, that. Some... Did, you, did you collect more than one data set of that? Yes. Yeah. For, and... for that one. For yeah. that one, no, it was just one and it just worked. For yeah. everything else, I think we collected maybe two. A poor, and maybe at least one more of another drug, and none of them really could get over this six angstrom magical number. Mm -hmm. I mean, it also could possibly be the ice thickness, yeah. because I think for that, even like every nanometer would count. But mm -hmm. our concentrations, our sample was the same. I, if it was the ice, I would never know. Because our concentration of that is 35 mg per mil that we require to get it. So there's no, no, no water for us anymore. Is, uh, can I just ask one further question, if it's okay? Was, was this all an LMNG detergents as well, Alyssa? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt. Um, Patrick? Hey, Alyssa. Hey, Patrick. Very nice talk. Um, before I ask my, my other question, did you try supplementing additional pop C into your preps that weren't going to high resolution? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that we really wanted is to basically to identify that law was to do the plus minus pop C. So all the ones that did go to high res, they had pop, pop C in it. And even the ones that didn't still have pop, sorry, not pop C, pop S. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, okay, back to my uh, other thing on the lipoxygenase. Have you thought about, given the, the different oligomeric forms, um, can you identify specific residues to disrupt, say, a hexama specifically, uh, or the, the tetrama uh, interface, um, uh, you know, either disrupting or, for example, putting in systems to, to basically trap um, yeah. those sort of states and, and look then at the function and, and binding and et cetera? That's a great question. And this is um, a topic for our NIH grant. Uh, but also, it is also a complicated topic because the interface lies right at the open, right at the entrance of the binding sites as well. And so there's also some um, additional, so I didn't talk about it, but there's some dynamics going on about the closure and opening of the binding sites. So basically all those mutations, you need to be very careful because they're also at other important bits of the proteins. Um, so I think cysteines, it just, it definitely would be a better strategy. They mm. haven't done it yet, but yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to ask? Um, Steph did. Steph. Hi, yeah. Lisa. Hey. Thank you. Great talk and beautiful structure. So, why did you need to use 34 make or meal up the protein to prepare coyote and green? Ah, 34. Um, we couldn't get the ice stable otherwise. That was in short. So, we basically started as, you know, conservative eight or nine mix per meal, which is, you know, conservative in the realm of GPCR. And what we had is what I call the exclusion zone. So basically your ice um, gets too thin and there's not enough particles to basically support it. So we went eight or nine and we still had those basically whole, like just whole, like too thin, nothing excludes. So we went then I think to 15 or 17 and it would still do the same thing. And however, and then we kept like, okay, fine, we can go higher. And so when you do at 34, the ice is basically perfect and stable. So we really get truly monolayer and there's no exclusion zones anywhere. So it's just like thin, uniform and quite nice. Maybe because there's no water anymore, I don't know. <laughs> but it really helps. So this is my, um, I think one of the main thing I do is that if I try to image membrane proteins and I have this trouble, this ice, uh, the only thing I really do is the easiest thing to do is to go high in concentration. Okay. It almost always work, works. Yeah, and it was easy to purify, like that much protein. It was. We had a bit of so obviously you know it's mammalian expression. It was we spent a lot. So could not be Katrina spent probably a year trying to figure this out. Um, at the end the backman system, so the viral uh, system was the one that gave, gave us sufficient amount. And actually the tags made a huge difference. So obviously coming from GPCR field, I started with like a classic plug and his, and that was just not doing well. And then the strap um, just really increased the yield. So from about a liter and a half, we could, um, make enough for quite a few grids. Well, I mean, quite a few, like it's still would be like 20 microliters, but it'll be maybe like a mink, which I, you know, in my world is actually quite good for membrane protein. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else want to ask a question? I guess not. Can I ask one? 
Yeah, it's a very basic question. So what do you think, uh, which tetramer hexamer monomeric form is, you know, acting out in, in the cellular context of, you know, when acting on um, catalyzing arachidonic acid and like, what, what do you think? I mean, because you have worked by yeah, It's a very, very good question. Again, in short, we don't know. Um, I suspect, I don't know. I, I want to think it's going to be a dimer uh, just for multiple reasons because of how the accessible the membrane, um, sorry, the entrance in the active side is. Um, and uh, But I don't have much to, to substantiate this. So one of the things that we really want to do is, um, it's another pad project in my lab that we're trying to do is we want to make um, the affinity purification grids where we can actually pull the protein straight out of the platelets and then um, basically analyze it. Uh, I, I think that'd be a really cool, um, but we're not there yet. All right. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thank you. And thank you everybody else for coming. Yeah. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining us. Um, our Next seminar is on 29th August at Bio21, and we'll be having Jose Maria Carrazzo with us. So hope you guys, hope to see you guys there. Thank you so much. Thank you.